Okay, today I'm going to do just a brief uh, PowerPoint explanation of the LAMP method. So when someone says I'm using LAMP, sometimes what they're really describing is they use LAMP words for light, the vocabulary. And I know that's confusing, but the two need to be kept separate. There's LAMP, the methodology, and then there's LAMP words for light, the vocabulary. And some people use LAMP words for light vocabulary and don't follow the method, and others use uh, another system and follow the method really well. So it's good to keep those two things separate. Um, again, just so you keep that straight. There's one confusing thing, is that sometimes people will show someone using LAMP on a low-tech board, like a manual board that's set up like LAMP. And that is a wonderful thing to see. We recommend it for everybody. But I do want you to understand, without multi-sensory convergence, without voice output, motor, whether it's your mouth or your hand, treating your hand as an articulator, the motor movement has a sound attached and you see something happen. And when motor, auditory, and visual are used together, those multi-sensory convergent neurons fire. So if you're using a low-tech board, you'd be missing the auditory output. So it's, it, it's a great thing to have a backup system. Some kids need it, some kids even start there, but it's not a prerequisite that you would have to start on a low-tech board. For many individuals, the voice is really needed for the learning to take place. Multi-sensory convergent neurons don't fire without the auditory output. So and you wanna make sure those devices volumes are loud too, loud enough for the person to hear. So just so you keep it straight, uh, Words for Life is a vocabulary. It comes on all PRC devices. It comes on Liberator's devices. It comes on the I iPad and they have iOS versions uh, that, that you can get off the iTunes store. But uh, it's a little bit wrong to say I use the LAMP methodology with a low-tech board, although we, again, I'm promoting you, telling you it's a good thing to have and everyone needs it. It's great for everybody, but it is not following the methodology of motor auditory visual. The first thing that's important for you to know is to surround the individual with people who get excited. When I look at this therapist's face and how excited she is working when the student just did something, I, I was always touched by this. But it's really important that the first component or the first treatment integrity of LAMP is that the individual who's working with the individual you're, that's trying to learn the device has a social connection to them. Language is gated by that social connection. And this mirror neuron system, what Ron LaBelle and Panetta and Oberman found out is that when the mirror neuron is more likely to happen, they put a hand in front of people's faces like this. When they did this with individuals with autism, it was less likely that the mirror neuron system was intact or that they, they basically, when I'm doing this, right now all of you are doing that with me. And when I say mom, your mouths are saying mom with me and it's why you can interpret that information because you use multi-sensory systems to interpret information. Well, individuals with autism, when they did this, were less likely to have the mirror neuron system intact. But then they did it again with a parent or a sibling, and there it showed up. And so what I want you to know is the very first component of LAMP is, is do I have a social connection to that person, that joint engagement, that involvement? So you follow their lead, you go to the things they have a passion for, and you have to be good at following their lead. And I want you to know the number one thing that gets a child ready to communicate is being able to say what they want to say, when they want to say it. So I want to say that again because it's so important. What really gets children and adults to appropriate readiness to learn is being able to say what they want to say, when they want to say it. Not what we wanted to say, when we wanted to say it. But so you have to really have the right vocabulary to follow their lead, to give them the word they want to say. Again, mirror neurons are performed when you see someone performing that same behavior, you don't catch yourself doing it. So if I see someone modeling the word eat on a device or see someone talking, the beautiful thing is I'm practicing, if I have an attack mirror neuron system, I'm practicing my device, but I put no cognitive effort into it. It's also sort of important for you to know that once it becomes a multi-sensory convergent uh, activity, any one of those sensory systems can activate the other. So I could hear the word mom and practice the word, or I could see your mouth and I would practice the auditory. So just so you know that uh, it's really important if we're going to be going to be teaching individuals how to communicate on a device that they have an intact mirror neuron system, which means the first and most important thing is that they have a social connection to the person they're working with. So be fun, follow their lead, make their lives better, and uh, you'll have a much better experience teaching language. Remember, it's all about multi-sensory convergence. The treatment integrity, again, is to be able to say what you want, when you want to say it. We also want to teach core words in isolation, but I want you to promise me that you'll love core language, but you'll not be against fringe vocabulary. I, I, I say this not to be snarky, but don't be a cuckoo for core and don't be a fanatic for fringe. 
be a bull for both. And I, I know that's, that's me trying to find a way to make you remember that. But core is a great thing and you need it. And the, some core words take longer to learn, but they lead to the language explosion. And some fringe words are really easy to draw a picture of. It's really easy to draw a picture of, of an ice cream cone or a snowman, but they don't occur very often in speech. And so we need to learn both the words that are easy to draw and the words that take uh, longer to learn and maybe harder to represent in a picture, but still are needed for me to have that language explosion. Because it's all about being able to segment speech to be able to hear those other words. You need to have a motor plan that doesn't change. A lot of people get confused about this. I hear people saying, oh, our system has motor planning too. I just want you to know that if you stay on a page ever, when you get to a page and it never locks in, then you no longer have a motor plan. So if once I go to the art page, it stays where red, red, red is in the corner, then when I go to the food page, or a trick you might want to do is go to a system, if they have a word finder, and type in a word and see if it occurs more than once. If it does, you probably don't have a system that keeps the motor plan the same. Remember again, it's all about motor, auditory, visual, and joy. Uh, you need to see the moment of joy for learning to take place. Uh, once the, if you think of my mouth moving, I have a motor movement when I said mom, I feel my lips, I hear the sound, I see something, and when I get joy in it, my brain releases the neurotransmitter to make learning take place. So you always wanna see joy in the activity. Joy or the reward moment creates memory or creates generalization. That was, this goes all the way back to 1949 when Donald Hebbs wrote that line that we've all known, cells that fire together, wire together. But the reason they wire together is because you release a neurotransmitter from that moment of joy. So you understand Hebbs' principle of mirror motor automaticity or motor learning or learning. Uh, kind of messed that up right there, so I apologize. But read more about Hebbs if you haven't read about Hebbs. It's an interesting thing that he did all this work and, and the research or the technology we have today proves he was right. In 1967, Pitts and Posner proposed the three stages of motor learning, the cognitive stage, the associative stage, and the automatic stage. And your children, when learning a device, go through those stages, and you need to be really good at being able to detect those stages. At the cognitive stage, it's more like babbling. They're just saying things, but they don't know what they're saying necessarily. I want you to reward those mishits as if it was listening to somebody talk. Those are very important mishits. They're not, they're not someone struggling to learn, that they're, they're babbling and your reaction to them learns, make, helps them learn what they mean. Sometimes they attach a meaning to a word that was not correct. They have an intrinsic value and they think they learned a word and they got it wrong. That actually leads to more words. The associate stage is where they can detect their errors. And I love the associate stage. And one, one of the, my favorite, things for you to watch for in the associate stage. I can't go over all the things to look for, but in this quick PowerPoint or this quick presentation. But when you see a person touching, 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 and they stop, usually it means they heard the word they were looking for. So if they want to say eat, they'll say go, they'll say more, they'll say no. But then when they get eat, they look up, and they quit accessing. It's a beautiful thing to see. So just so you know, that's what the associate stage looks like. The automatic stage is when they want to say eat or something, they move very fluidly to it and they say the word without, oh, without a break in the motor movement. So if I'm at the automatic level and I want to say more, I basically hit that sequence fluidly. I don't hit and then do a little search. So if you're searching or you're looking or you're doing like this, you're at the associative stage. And the automatic generalize is where, the, where I think you'll find the real beauty starts happening. So here again are those stages of motor learning and it's all, all again about multi-sensory convergence occurring. Uh, so you want to see them using these words spontaneously across environments, engaging with people, initiating communication. And, when, and again, at the automatic stage, they have to put no cognitive effort into the articulator. They really move fluidly. You and I put no cognition into our motor movements. If we did, it would become much more difficult. There's a data collection form we can send you, but if you don't use the LAMP data collection form, I really encourage you to do it. Just email us and we'll send you this data collection form so you can keep track. Because when you keep data and you see the word gets to that generalized stage, some of you are gonna notice that those words that made it to the generalized and used in other settings stage, oftentimes start becoming produced verbally. And that makes you able to collect that data and understand it and follow that data. And it makes progress more likely. So some of the treatment integrity you observe, we are about to release the treatment integrity sheet or basically a, 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 the treatment integrity form so you can actually go through the entire treatment integrity and make sure you're following it. 
these are just some of the treatment integrities that I want you to sort of the bullet ones. First, how good does the individual follow the lead of the person they're working with? And that's really important that they actually do follow their lead because that's what gets them in appropriate readiness to learn. Do they change the vocabulary based on what the individual wants to say when they want to say it? Do they accept all forms of communication equally? It is really hard sometimes when we first get a communication device to accept all the other forms because we want to see the device work. But if you're passing out a drink and the student does this, what you have to do at that moment is accept this as drink. You can verbally cast back or you can cast back by touching that sequence on a device, but you wouldn't say, say it again on your talker because oh, that makes them mad. If anybody's ever had someone correct their grammar, you know what it's like to have someone tell you to say it again. You just want to be a communicator. Well, it gets somebody's length of utterance or gets them to use more communications, not the form they use, it's the quality of the exchange. I've already said this, but I wanted to make sure you understand that if you're following the LAMP treatment integrity, you'd have a device that has both core and fringe words simultaneously. The trick to a language explosion is having many words at one time and, being, and understanding that some words take longer to learn and, and are harder to draw in a picture, but you still need access to those words. You would model language at the appropriate level. You're modeling just a little above the individual. I want, we love modeling, and we love to, use, to see another person using a communication device to communicate. A model needs a communicator and a listener. You have to model slow enough so the individual you're working with can actually see the sequence. If they only see half the sequence because you're modeling too fast, it can be quite confusing. There's a lot more to that, but we just, as a rule, we love modeling and nothing we love more than video modeling. So I encourage you, if you're using the LAMP method, you'd be using video modeling. You're generalizing vocabulary in a session. So as soon as you teach a word, you're generalizing that word. So if I have a student says go to make the car go, I'm immediately getting a balloon or something else to go. There's two things children do with language. They overextend words and they underextend. And you expect both to be happening. Overextensions oftentimes lead to the language explosion. So if I see a child using the word more for daddy's wrestling and mommy's kisses and grandma's cookies, uh, uh, then the word more would tell me that they're ready for those other words. So where I see overextensions, all animals are doggy, then I start storing the animals. But one of the biggest mistakes made in our field is giving kids too small of a vocabulary and waiting for them to master those set of words before we give them the next set. Give them more words than they know, model vocabulary on the fly in the different settings, changing what they're saying really quickly and make keeping it fun by following their lead and generalize those words immediately so they can see those words mean many things based on context, environment, who they're with, what word came before or after it. The next one seems silly, but if you're following the LAMP method, you would always have, a, almost always, it's not true for everybody, and no rule is 100%, but almost always you'd understand the benefits of a key guard. A key guard just creates that motor automaticity. It also creates the static grid, which lets your finger know where you're going to move before you touch the Basically, you can, your, your hand knows the sequence before you touch. I encourage you to watch someone like Lance Macklemore or many of our device users communicating on their devices. And notice that most of the best users almost universally have a key guard. Some of them even use a tactile key guard like we've created for the VI program. You want to make sure you reward complete motor movements, but not half of a motor movement. Now, this is very confusing to put in this introductory PowerPoint. But if somebody hits half of a sequence and then gets distracted and then hits the second half, I don't want you to reward that motor movement because it became two different motor movements. Well, and the main thing this concept I need you to understand is don't ever hit half of a sequence for a child. And people, or I always say child, but I mean child and adult individual. We do this out of love, but when, the when, when we hit half of the sequence and the individual can hit the second half, that's called a backwards chain. We're learning the back half first, but in learning motor movements, it always needs to be a forward chain. We always need to learn what, mo what movement got us to that page. Otherwise, I just want you to think about this. If you do the backwards chain and learning communication device, every word would be in the same location. So, uh, or many words would be in the same location. So just think, if I, hit, if I hit something to say eat in the second half of the buttons here, and I hit drink in the second half there, and I hit go in the second half is in the same location, and the same motor movement set all three words. It's really the first part of the motor movement that's really important. 
So we do it out of love, but don't hit part of the sequence for them. Use vocabulary builder when you're teaching that motor movement so that they can touch the entire sequence, become fluid with it, and then bring back more words. You need to make sure you change the words being taught based on the client's motivation. If you have a student who has a passion for animals, then they need those animals really early on. So just so you make sure you again understand that we are not against fringe words. People have passions for them. I know a student who has a passion for burritos, and so he needs to be able to stuff them and build them and eat them and weigh them and put different ingredients in them and cook them. And, and then he needs a lot of words based on that thing. Remember that we teach words and not phrases. It's Sometimes people think we're just anti-phrase. If you're at the full level or have a large vocabulary, we just don't have any problem with you putting in jokes or you having a speech in there. But if you can't say the words that fill up your language, you won't be able to combine those words together to make novel utterances. It really does take a word-based system to be able to communicate. And I want you to know that when children and adults make combination of words that they understand or have meaning to them but aren't grammatically correct, that leads to the language explosion. So if they say, mine goat or mine go, where's daddy, daddy, daddy work, those, that type of combination of words are, is a beautiful thing to see. I've already said it, but I'm going to say it again. Make sure you have a large vocabulary. Probably the number one reason why most kids have failed at their communication devices is that they had too few words, not too many. And remember, that's why we have to give you more buttons, because more buttons means less sequencing. So a lot of times I hear people talk about wanting less buttons on the device. We use Vocabulary Builder, but not giving you less locations, because less locations means more sequencing. Just remember the old phone where you had to do JKL. Nobody wants to go back to that. All right, and make sure that as you see someone learn a word, you transition to the next level very quickly. So what we've been saying is that having these core words and having words stored as a motor plan and having these words stored as multisensory convergent neurons all leads to this ability to segment incoming speech. If you ask me what's the one thing you think really leads to the, some of these individuals doing so well and having this language explosion, I would say that they start segmenting incoming speech. And so there's lots of research that tells us that individuals with autism do not have the ability to segment between words, hallucinate the spaces, L-M-N-O-P. They would chunk that information together. And so again, just giving you more research about segmentation and the importance of, of segmentation. Segmentation is all about motor, auditory, visual, creating that multisensory convergence. Once that word's stored there, then when I hear that word, I my because I have a mirror neuron system intact, I can hear those spaces and have that language explosion. If you haven't ever done the McGurk effect, go online and just Google McGurk effect. And then remember that individuals with autism show a slower rate of the McGurk effect than their peers. And if you think about that, you'll come up with the same conclusion that what the McGurk, their lack of hearing the spaces or changing the word during the McGurk effect shows that they don't have multisensory convergence at the same uh, understanding or same level as their typical developing peers. More references on that subject for you. More references, just again, we just like to give you research. And at the end of this, I'm going to give you a list of all of these. So, so just so you know, again, multisensory convergence and the importance of mirror neurons is what LAMP's all about. The things you need to can understand are things that make segmentation more possible. First, it's not going to happen until words are at the automatic level where you put no cognition into the articulator because when you hear the word for the mirror neuron system to work, you, you're not thinking about it. You don't feel it. Um, speech must be on at the word level. It is really important if you're following the LAMP method that each time they say the word, they hear it. They wouldn't build a sentence and speak the display at the end. And again, if you're a very high level user who speaks in sentences and you choose to turn your speech off, that's because you already have segmentation of speech. You already have that language at that level. But for most individuals who are learning language, they need to hear the word at the word level. Think of it this way. If my mouth moved a whole bunch and then out came the speech, then I wouldn't be segmenting at the word level. So speech must be on at the word level. Um, you have to have access again to core and fringe. The key guard again is recommended. Text at its largest second set setting is recommended. Many individuals with autism have a love for literacy and they can read before we understand it or recognize it. But you might not have noticed this, but when you say a word, the font's very large because it's, for some individuals, that font exploding on the screen becomes a reward, which basically reinforces literacy and they might already have an intrinsic love for literacy that you didn't necessarily see right away. Um, making sure the voice is loud enough. 
a lot of times speakers are faced in a direction for the listener that you're talking to. That, so I'm the communicator and I'm talking to someone else and the speakers are faced out like this. I'm more concerned that the individual using the device can hear their voice than I am you, believe it or not. So for segmentation, I need them to hear it and you to hear it is very important. Again, no phrases or no words to hear a word. One of the biggest mistakes in our field is where you hear a word to get the second word. You hear the word eat before you can get the word cookie. So then the individual thinks eat cookie becomes a word. If I was teaching a foreign language like Spanish, it'd be comer galleta, and then I hand you a cookie. Comer galleta, and I hand you a cookie. I would chunk that information together and believe comer galleta is a word. So just so you know, you don't you want a word-based system, no carrier phrases, no phrases like I feel, and then up comes sad. You want to see the core words highlighted in text and in books and in their environment. Uh, it is very beneficial for them to have screenshots that label their environment. So just so you understand, again, LAMP is a neurological approach that tries to integrate the use of multisensory convergent to promote the development of language. The five key elements of LAMP, again, are making sure the child or the adult or the individual you're working with is at an appropriate readiness to learn. You do this by giving them the word they want to say when they want to say it. Then you have a consistent and unique motor movement. The motor movement is consistent and it's unique to the other words. And that unique is very important to understand. When we design words for life, by design, we space words that be likely taught together farther apart. So mom is here and dad is farther away by design. The device you use has to have an immediate auditory signal. So when you're looking at lamp, if you were using a low-tech board again, because you had no auditory signal, it would end here. But there's nothing again wrong with that. I just want you to put the purity of this needs to understand if you're saying I follow the lamp method, you'd have auditory output. And that auditory output would be immediate. Yet be very careful if you're using an iPad that the version hasn't gotten obsolete where the auditory output's not immediate. When I touch the sequence, I need to hear the word immediately. If the word gets delayed, I'll touch that sequence, not hear it talk, hit another sequence, hear the first word, and you're going to have a lot of multi-sensory convergent nightmare going on there or, or sensory integration nightmare. So I have a, I, I'm ready because I can say the word I want to say. I have a consistent and unique motor movement that pr always produces that same auditory signal immediately. And then I see something happen. Here's your readiness. You're at an appropriate arousal level for learning. Here's your motor. Here's your auditory. There's your visual. The visual changes based on context, what word I said before it or behind it what environment I'm in, and then the joint engagement comes as really the moment of joy, which releases the neurotransmitter that makes learning take place. So that's LAMP sort of in a visual. Interventions always need to address the integration of the sensation and see the brain as a whole rather than isolated regions. Just remember we all learn better when the better we use our sensory systems together. I love this, again, it's more for me than for anyone else, but it really is worth us all remembering. The greatest obsolete discovery is not ignorance, it's the illusion of knowledge. And if my, myself or anyone else ever pretends they understand what to do, they're just crazy as a loon. We're all trying our hardest and we appreciate you helping us, especially the families out there helping us learn by sharing your adults and the individuals you work with. So here's just some resources for the PowerPoint I just put together. So again, my name is John Halloran. I'm the Senior Clinical Associate from the Center for AC and Autism, co-developer of the LAMP method. And there's my email. Anything we can do to help you, let us know. And I hope this little uh, presentation is somewhat beneficial to you understanding the LAMP method.